Good afternoon, I'm Governor John Carney. Thank you for joining us uh, remotely uh, and here in the auditorium to uh, Delaware's response to COVID-19, our biweekly uh, press conference. Uh, we're gonna go over the, the situation uh, in our state, uh, some of the difficult challenges that uh, we're facing and, and our efforts to address uh, problem areas uh, across Delaware, particular uh, issues that we're seeing in the lower part of our state. I want to take a minute to, to thank our tech team. I, I haven't uh, done that in the many uh, briefings that we've had uh, for uh, getting us online and, and uh, being at the controls there as, as we try to get the word out to Delawareans across our state. We appreciate uh, your hard work and, and cooperation and, and everybody else that, that makes this possible. Uh, today we've got a unique uh, telecom uh, telecommunications uh, thing going on here with uh, Dr. Uh, Carol Odom Walker, the Secretary of Health and Social Services, who is uh, zooming in, I guess, uh, to, to the uh, press conference this afternoon to provide some important information on data uh, that we've been collecting over the last uh, several weeks. Of course, uh, uh, with me also is uh, the Director of the Delaware Emergency Management AG, Agency, A.J. Shaw, who's been our point person on this, uh, coordinating the efforts of first responders, community action, uh, public health, uh, working with the, uh, with the hospitals, the healthcare providers, uh, community organizations across our state and doing a great job, unflappable, uh, each day that we uh, confront this terrible uh, pandemic. Um, I wanna make a few, few opening comments and then go through the, the deck here. Uh, first, uh, we're working kind of on two pathways right now. One is to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that, uh, and the virus as it spreads across our state. And we'll talk a little bit about that or a lot about that with re respect to the, the situation in the lower part of our state. And at the same time, we're starting to think about and stand up uh, an operation that will, uh, when the time is right, reopen sectors of our economy and trying to do that at the same time. Uh, there are a number of factors that we have to have in place in order to reopen. Uh, most importantly, a, an extensive uh, testing, contact tracing, isolation approach at a level much greater than what, what we're doing today in terms of testing. And so coming up with the, that plan, assuring the supplies and resources and the supply chain for it as well as thinking through how to bring the staff on to do the contact tracing part of it is a critical component of our ability to move forward after we move through the 28 days of declining uh, cases in our state. And so we do have some time to do that, but obviously the public health team uh, and our other teams in state government uh, with respect to business and labor, working through what those uh, openings might look like is gonna be a, an important focus uh, over the next 28 days and, and beyond. And importantly, we do have on the state website uh, a survey to the public to get input on, on, on that process. And we would encourage you to engage and, and to tell us uh, what you think. At the same time, we're gonna stand up uh, or work with groups of kind, of kind of sector groups, focusing on individual sectors in our economy as we talked about before and, and how they can come up safely. But uh, while that's happening, we're gonna be really leaning into the challenges that we face and in particular addressing hotspots across our state. So let's turn to, to the data that uh, drives everything that we do. The number of positive cases continues to rise. Uh, we're up now over 3,000, almost to 3,500. Uh, very sadly, we've reached uh, the century mark in the total deaths across our state. They still overwhelmingly are in the senior and elderly frail population. Uh, and sadly, in our hearts and prayers go out to their families uh, as well. We've had seven, uh, 703 recoveries, uh, which is important. And again, the number that we look at 
on a regular basis and, and some concern with its uh, increase there, uh, 277 uh, current hospitalizations. One of the things that we're going to see in, in the, uh, in the co county breakdown uh, is uh, about the same number of cases in Newcastle County as there are in, in Sussex County, and, and these numbers uh, don't reflect uh, testing that's uh, been done recently there as we attempt to uh, get our arms around uh, the in spread of the infection uh, in the poultry worker community in, in, uh, in Sussex County. So 1,486 positive cases in Newcastle County, in Kent County, uh, 558, and in Sussex County, 1,394. When you convert the, those number of cases uh, to uh, a case per 1,000 or per, per 10,000 measure, that infection rate in Sussex County is three, almost three times what it is uh, in Newcastle County, and, and we'll talk uh, a little bit about that. Now, some of the breakdown there, uh, we also have uh, four cases with an unknown uh, address, uh, and then some of the other breakdowns that we have in terms of the age range. We're still under, I'm told, we're still under the age 50 in terms of the median age, and that's an important benchmark because the lower that median age, the more likely or the less likely we have uh, cases in the very vulnerable populations, 65 and older. And uh, we've seen that uh, the virus is uh, not nearly as, uh, as deadly, certainly, and, and as debilitating in younger, uh, in younger adults and, and children. The next sl slide that we have is uh, just the series of, of uh, changes to the state of emergency declaration. Uh, we continue to look at that and are looking at some changes uh, today that uh, might apply to the situation that's uh, emerging there and, and has been for some time in, in Sussex County. One of the things that, uh, that is clear to us now as we look at the, the data, particularly the increased uh, number of cases in, in Sussex County, if we can go to the next slide, um, that uh, today we're making it official that the schools will be, remain closed for students through the end of this school year. Uh, we expect that uh, schools and teachers would finish out the last two months as they have been with remote learning and uh, get as much instructional time and learning with their, their students as possible. Uh, there's obviously no replacement for in-person instruction in classrooms in terms of the relationships and the services, uh, but obviously uh, doing what we can between now and, and the end of uh, what, what would be in the school year. Uh, we want to get as much benefit for our students as possible, but uh, we've announced today that uh, the schools will remain closed uh, for the end of this school year and, and uh, encourage our superintendents uh, to start planning for uh, summer learning and instruction, uh, summer f f food distribution and preparation for the new, n new school year next year. I know one of the things uh, on their minds is to celebrate uh, seniors as they graduate uh, and to obviously give them some, some recognition. Uh, it won't be a, a gradu graduation ceremony like we're all used to. And, and really enjoy and, and a celebration for, for families and for those seniors, but uh, some way to recognize their achievement there. So next, uh, we have a series of slides that just show the increase in the number of cases. The hospitalization rate still uh, tends to be lower than our, than our estimated hospitalization rate, which I think in, that, in this chart is 15% of total cases. Uh, originally, we were using a 20% a assumption there, and so that's a very positive thing because it's the hospitalizations and the critical care, the need for critical hospital care is uh, where we uh, worry about uh, uh, people that have COVID-19 uh, dying in, in the hospital, and, and so we, we and preserving that capacity uh, in the event that we do uh, get uh, a bigger surge in the days and weeks ahead. We have some slides here that show some of the earlier projections, again, just to kind of demonstrate what we were seeing early on and earlier dates uh, in terms of a steeper increase in the number of cases, a steeper, steeper increase in the number of hospitalizations, 
And so we've consistently been on, under those projections. And as we've changed the assumptions, the actual uh, graph of our number of cases uh, tends to be closer to the predict predictions that we've had. So far, and, and keep our fingers crossed on this, uh, we've continued to be under the projection, uh, both for the number of cases and hospitalizations. Uh, and so we hope that that will continue. The next slide, again, is an, another, uh, this is the actual number of cases uh, versus the projection going forward uh, in the last couple uh, squares there. Tough to see from here, but hopefully uh, where you're viewing from, you can see those, uh, that graph sloping upward at the, end, uh, at the end of the stream there. So next, uh, this is something again that we'll be looking at day by day and it illustrates pretty well uh, one of the challenges that we have in getting uh, a consistent downward trend of declining cases by day, which as we uh, have said several times based on the, the guidance from the White House Task Force and CDC, you'll be looking for a 14 day decline in those cases. You can see it's kind of uh, uneven. It's up and down the number of new cases per day. It tends to, to rise on a, a, a pretty steady pattern up to where we are today. But on any given day, it could be down a little bit or up a little bit. And that, in part, is due to the fact that we have irregular testing dates. Most of those tests are being done at hospital locations. We're starting to over-test in so-called hot spots or areas in the state with you know, a higher uh, infection rate. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Sussex County, uh, some of the uh, minority and, and vulnerable communities here in Newcastle County. Um, and so we need to correct for that as we look forward. And one of the measures that we're looking at as a trigger is the, the percentage of total cases that are positive. And so seeing a decline in that measure as a trigger. Uh, the next uh, slide, I should turn it over to Dr. Walker, and why don't I just want to say a word or two before Dr. Walker uh, starts her, her remarks, and we thank her for coming in remotely. Uh, it, it will be an interesting part, a new part of our, our press uh, availability here. Uh, we've been for several weeks now uh, trying to get uh, data uh, for the testing results that we have uh, by race and ethnicity. Uh, because we didn't have a full complement of that data from the beginning uh, from some of the, uh, the private uh, health lab, private uh, testing labs that were doing some of that. We ordered a couple weeks ago that that be included, and so we have more data on a contemporaneous basis. So we went, tried to go backwards and fill in some of those gaps, and we're able to do that to a certain extent, but not completely. And Dr. Walker is going to talk about. Uh, some of those results and our response to that. So Dr. Walker, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for allowing me to join the, the team virtually today, this morning. We launched a page devoted to COVID-19 related data on the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services website. Uh, it's called My Healthy Community and we heard loudly that the Yeah, so apparently we're having uh, some technical diff difficulty with the internet uh, connection uh, for Dr. Walker's uh, presentation. So if it's possible, uh, we can, can jump over can this. There we go. She's back. We can hear I you. I don't know. The technology is fine all the way until now. But uh, what's important is that we are launching data on My Healthy Community at specifically by race. Uh, this is how we can provide more of that in-depth data by zip code and potentially in the future will extend even further. If you're not familiar with this website, we do want you to know that this uh, is a build on to the My Healthy Community data portal that we launched in May 2019. It delivers neighborhood focused population health, environmental, social determinants of health information to the public and conveys the community's ways to explore a variety of data indicators 
We think it's important that communities have information about their neighborhood in, in their hands. This new coronavirus data that you're seeing in the community supplements the existing dashboard that's on our coronavirus website. It doesn't replace it, but it just gives additional information and drill down. So I encourage everyone who's interested to take time, explore the data, and I wanna call your attention to a few data sets. The first is that, as the governor mentioned, we are seeing an increasing rate of positive cases in Sussex County. That's more than twice the rate of infections in Newcastle County. That, that is based on the number of positive cases and the population of Sussex. As the governor, Dr. Rattay and I have said for weeks, we all certainly must behave as if we have coronavirus, uh, but nowhere is this true more than in Sussex County. So we have a lot more work to do. But I want to make sure that everyone knows we want to help our neighbors across the state. Right now, our attention has to be to support those in Sussex County. For older Delawareans in Sussex and those with other chronic health conditions, we absolutely need you to stay home 24-7. If it's not essential, please just reconsider. Do not go out for groceries or prescriptions. We can certainly help you get uh, needed food, groceries, prescriptions deliver to you. Just call us at 211 for assistance and we will make sure that you have what you need. If you live elsewhere in Delaware or have a vacation home or relatives who live in Sussex County, we ask you right now to not go visit your relatives or that vacation home. If you go, you are likely to expose yourself and your loved ones to coronavirus. But most importantly, if you're sick with an elevated temperature, a cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, or body aches, we need you to stay home. Please, please stay home and self-quarantine. Monitor your temperature, monitor your... And call your provider, your primary care doctor, who can guide you on whether or not you need to be tested for COVID-19. If you don't have a provider, the Division of Public Health will help you call Delaware 211, and we will make sure that you have information and can get an order to be tested. Finally, I wanna offer a few words to our neighbors whose first language is in Spanish. And for those of you who understand, I'm doing my best and trying. Uh, but no tenga miedo si su doctor le ordena a usted a tomar pruebas médicas. No tenga miedo si su resultado es positivo. Y más que todo, no tenga miedo si usted o un miembro de su familia necesita atención médica si sus síntomas se ponen más severos. Nosotros estamos aquí, el gobierno estatal y la comunidad médica para ayudarle a usted y a su familia y recordarle que su privacidad está protegida por la ley. La salud de su familia es nuestra mayor prioridad. Por favor, llamo, llamo a todos. Translation, do not be afraid to call a doctor if you have symptoms of COVID-19. Do not be afraid if a doctor refers you for testing and do not be afraid if your test is positive. And most of all, do not be afraid if you or someone in your family needs medical care because your symptoms become severe. We are all here, the state government and the medical community to help you. We want you and your family to feel safe and we will respect your privacy. Your family's health is our highest priority. So to support our neighbors in Sussex County, the Division of Public Health this week, in collaboration with hospital systems, community organizations, and large employers, expanded free rapid testing across the county. This will also include expanded outreach and educational efforts, making sure that individuals and families who cannot leave their homes, cannot work, and cannot go out to get essential items and groceries and prescriptions that they will have the support they need from social services and community organizations to support those needs. Again, if you do need medical or social services support or anywhere in our state, but including in Sussex, please call Delaware 211. And finally, I wanted to touch on testing. First, the Division of Public Health, which runs tests on specimens collected primarily from healthcare providers first responders and residents and staff from long-term care facilities has run a total of 2,780 as of April 23rd. Of those tests, 669 have been positive and 2,114 have been negative. And the healthcare systems in our state, which make up Delaware testing program, 
have collected a total of 19,595 specimens as of April 22nd. This information is now posted on our community portal as well as on our dashboard. Thank you, Governor, for that opportunity to give an overview. Thank you, uh, Dr. Walker, and thank you for displaying your, your Spanish uh, here on the presser today. I'm glad that your Spanish teacher had a better result with you than my Spanish teacher did with me for, for four years. Um, on the testing, I, I want to take a minute before I hand it over to, to AJ, I just uh, uh, comment and thank our, our partners in testing because most of the testing that's done, most of that 20,000 test has been uh, done by our hospital partners uh, from Christiana Care uh, to uh, St. Francis and to Nemours and to Bay Health and to BB and to Nanticoke uh, and to the VA. And so we appreciate all of their work uh, we are uh, starting to do additional testing uh, in the, the George, Sussex County, Georgetown area, and, and did some of that this week. As I indicated earlier in the week, we are going to do. Uh, we also have uh, moved, uh, Christiana Care has moved their Middletown uh, mobile unit uh, up to P.S. DuPont for a mobile site there, and are looking at other areas around Newcastle County, particularly areas that with uh, underrepresented uh, populations there, and, and uh, we appreciate their, their outreach with that, and we will continue to, to use data to drive that. We're also looking at uh, doing some uh, testing in the Route 9 corridor uh, as well, and there'll be uh, more about that later. So thank you to our, our testing partners. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, one of the biggest challenges, if not the biggest challenge that we have is to develop a testing program that's uh, kind of two times or more, three times as robust as this, and this is close to 20,000 uh, tests. So you can imagine the number of tests uh, that we'll, we'll be doing, the staff that that will uh, require, uh, the coordination necessary, and, and obviously the partners who have been with us all along the way. So Dr. Walker, thank you. Thanks for coming in. And uh, I'll turn it over to, to A.J. Shaw. Thank you, Governor. Um, it was January 22nd when we had our first uh, state call that had started discussions about preparing for COVID. And I think we've uh, come a long way in that time, but we still know we have a lot of work to do and a lot of outreach to do with our communities. Uh, to talk about a little bit about the personal protective equipment that has been uh, distributed in the state, uh, public health uh, warehouse has fulfilled over 900 orders, uh, which in includes 800,000 pieces of equipment and over 650 gallons of hand sanitizer, and that's gone to hospitals, first responders, nursing home, and medical facilities. Uh, they continue to uh, accept orders and push them out as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, as I said last week, we have had a uh, little bit more success in the supply chain, so we feel that the uh, personal protective equipment has stabilized a little bit. However, we are still uh, trying to procure when possible and make sure uh, we know that this is gonna be around more than just um, the next few weeks. Uh, Delaware National Guard, uh, I've said for years now that they are our muscle and our, uh, you know, uh, our voice and vision on the street, and that's definitely showing through right now. Uh, they have taken on multiple medical missions uh, with new moors, with some state facilities. Uh, they are working to prepare uh, for surge capacities at a number of facilities around the state to really kind of be that uh, plug and play type uh, mentality that uh, in, in program that we need to be flexible to uh, handle the uptick in COVID positives. They've also been busy this week in building uh, these uh, care kits that I know Dr. Walker and uh, Dr. Tate talked about last week. We know that we have communities down in Sussex County right now that are having a higher uh, incidence and uh, positive uh, percentage of cases. Uh, we need to make sure we provide them supplies and what they need to help slow the spread. And that is everything from uh, cloth bandanas to make face coverings, to uh, thermometers, to hand sanitizer, to just a simple bleach and water solution and paper towels to make sure they could sanitize the areas where they live. We know there are um, individuals that are living with uh, multiple different people and sometimes having uh, that capacity in an apartment or a home is going to uh, potentially increase the spread. We wanna make sure they could slow it down as much as possible by uh, hygiene and uh, cleaning. So Guard has been instrumental. Uh, we will have about 10,000 of these to distribute over the next week and still ordering more supplies. Um, today, I believe right now, they should be 
finishing the third of three uh, food missions as well with the Delaware Food Bank. Uh, they did one on Monday in Newcastle. They did one at Dover Downs, which we have a picture of here on Wednesday, and then one at uh, in uh, Sussex County today. Uh, each time they've uh, provided uh, food, and this is everything from vegetables to canned food uh, to milk to juices. Uh, to about 2,000 families. I believe it's about 2,200 on Monday, just under 2,000 on Wednesday, and I haven't got the numbers today, but looking at millions of pounds of food to help uh, the communities impacted by COVID uh, really sustain and just help a little bit to make sure people aren't going hungry. So uh, not just kudos to the National Guard here, but the volunteers that are out there today, as well as uh, the Delaware Food Bank, who's making this all happen. Talked about the personal protective equipment, but what happens is we get these in boxes of, you know, tens and 20,000s, and then we have to put out push packages to go to either hospitals or uh, public safety agencies and the, the National Guard are the ones right now peeling those apart and creating the other packages. So a tedious task, but it is letting public health be more uh, reactive and put their, their expertise in other areas that need to be handled. Um, one thing that I think Dr. Walker quickly covered was uh, 211 and they are uh, what I would call the community's lifeline right now. They're going to be able to help uh, meet unmet needs to the best of our ability to those that are impacted right now. Uh, every day we get a summary. They're taking a few hundred calls a day. Um, it's a very dedicated team and we're, they're helping us get them to the right individual to answer their questions. Just two quick stories I'll share with you. Uh, first was, uh, and it's great. So when they send us these summaries, they send us one or two abstracts from uh, you know good and bad data that they're getting from talking to these uh, citizens. And uh, just two stories today that I think show the importance of the partnership with 2 on one and how uh, resilient the Delaware community is. So there's a father uh, and son that called. Uh, father was 72, son was 37, and uh, son was furloughed from uh, work and trying to do something with his father but not able what they could do because of the uh, stay-at-home orders. Um, and calling 2 on one just to see how they could volunteer, they were linked up with one of the uh, pantries in their neighborhood and were able to go out and assist them over the next several days. So again, not something that they needed from this, from 2 on one or uh, DHSS, but a way they were able to help their community. And then the second one, a woman called 2 on one from Ohio calling for her father who was 75 years old and just knew he wasn't able to get to the grocery stores because of the stay at home order. And uh, 2 on one was able to reach out to the uh, West End neighborhood house to uh, get individuals to actually go to the grocery store for and pick it up and deliver it. So these are, you know, two of approximately 15 to 20 stories we receive a week uh, from the United Way. And it just shows you how, uh, you know, how special the community is in Delaware and how much United Way is, is helping us uh, navigate through these tough times. Uh, lastly is our hospitalizations. Uh, governor's talked about this uh, since, you know, March uh, 11th in our first press conference. It is the area that probably we spend um, some of the most time discussing and making sure we keep our fingers on the pulse. And uh, this is not a, as good a story as the United Way story, but you'll see here um, the hospitalizations for Newcastle County, Kent, Sussex, and then overall in the state uh, for really uh, three different time periods with the most updated being yesterday. And that number is going up and that is not good. Um, we are in constant communication with our hospital systems across the state. Uh, they are in a position right now where they still have several hundred beds available, but we need to make sure that if people need medical assistance, they're contacting their primary care physician or they're going to the hospital earlier rather than later. Dr. Walker hit home on that as well in her overview. Uh, last week, uh, two of the hospitals in Sussex County had individuals that were walking into the hospital and within hours were already in the intensive care unit. And that is what is going to um, really impact the hospital system and it's not good for their health. So if somebody you know is sick, if you think somebody needs medical care, uh, you know, have them contact their uh, medical provider. If not, then they could go to the hospital or call 911. And as we work with our healthcare communities in Sussex County, we're going to make sure we do the best to get healthcare professionals in the community to do outreach with the individual. So the hospitals are uh, getting busier, which we don't like to see, but they're able to handle what they have right now. And we want to do everything we can to make sure we get the care to the person before it's too late for them. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Governor. Yeah, so thank you, uh, AJ. Thank you for your leadership and that of your team. And just to underscore uh, a couple points as we close it out, and that is uh, that we have a, a serious situation in, in Sussex County. And as Dr. Walker and AJ have mentioned, uh, there are certain guidelines that everybody needs to follow. 
uh, and they are uh, things that we've been saying for the last uh, six weeks here, or, or not, not quite six weeks with our stay-at-home order, but to stay at home, to practice basic hygiene, to protect your neighbors, and in the process, uh, save lives, and also in the process to prevent the spread uh, of the virus from, from going further into our communities. And we will and are leaning into uh, this effort uh, in Sussex County to treat those who are sick, uh, to help them with the uh, resources that they need, uh, to help protect those who are uh, without the virus uh, and, and, and all of the rest. So again, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're on this together and we're gonna get through it together as long as we uh, follow the instructions and follow the guidance that we've been talking about now for, for over six weeks. So with that, I'll open it up to questions from the press. Meredith, thanks for coming. I have a lot of them, so get ready. <laughs> um, <laughs> so to start off with the race data, it's showing that um, black Delawareans are being affected the most. What is the state doing to make sure that black Delawareans, specifically in the Newcastle County area, aren't continually being disproportionately affected? By the coronavirus yeah so the main thing obviously is uh treatment in, in the hospitals wh when they uh require hospitalization uh the second i think most important thing and and we co uh, continue to move to that is kind of over testing or targeting uh, ge geographic areas with larger uh, pr proportions of of uh, people of color we mentioned uh, the testing the christiana care uh, moved from w middletown to to north wilmington the testing uh, that they're doing in conjunction with the LACC testing that was done out of Henrietta Johnson and our uh, plans to, to do testing along the Route, route 9 corridor. Right now, uh, the, there's intense focus on testing and uh, outreach to the Hispanic, to the Haitian Creole population and uh, Caucasian uh, poultry worker population in Sussex County. And that's taken a lot of our resources and our lo a lot of our time, and we re really uh, have a, a lot of work to do there and, and are uh, adjusting our plans based on what we're seeing on the ground in terms of test results. And in terms of, I think the data said 40% was unknown in terms of race. How much of that does the state see as retrievable eventually, or were those issues with going back and not being able to get the race data, is that what yeah, makes up that 40%? My understanding was the 40% was the first increment before we went and matched up the, uh, the two databases and that in doing that matchup, so we matched up the public health, what's called DEERS database with the DIN, Delaware Health Information Network database, which had more racial and ethnic uh, data there. And uh, we picked up another, uh, I don't know, 20%. We have about 20 or 25% without data, somewhere thereabouts is my understanding. And so whether we'll be able to fill that in, we're certainly gonna act on the data that we have and, and some of the things that we know. And I wanna, I don't have hospitalization data that I know by race. That's something that's important to have. Uh, we do know the breakout of those who've passed away and uh, the people of color who've passed, or African Americans who've passed away, is about a, just a little bit above the percentage in the population at like 24, 25 percent. So of our 92 uh, deaths, uh, and then um, the infection rate, which we talked about, which is is much higher, and that's that is concerning. W one of the things that we are seeing in the data is that the the participation rate, the number of tests done for African Americans is at a higher rate than their percentage in the population, which gives you a little bit of a confidence that maybe it's not a testing access problem. That doesn't mean we're not going to try to reach out into those areas, but it would really concern me if, if the rate was less than uh, the, the distribution in the population at 23%. Uh, Dr. Walker, I think, wanted to add something there. Well, I, if you wish, Governor, I'm, I'm happy to um, share my screen and show you the data um, as we have it, um, because I think it is important to know that our race ethnicity data is improving. As you mentioned, we enriched the data. We, we were able to get some uh, gap close in the number of unknowns, but that should grow smaller as we have more uh, documented race ethnicity and, and work backwards to make sure we're filling in that data as well. Um, happy to do that demo if that would be useful. 
So are we able to tee up the demo or, or should we go to another question? She just has to share her screen. You need to share your screen, Dr. Walker, I'm told. Great, that means go. I will do it. Well, that's teeing up. Uh, Meredith, did you have another question? Oh, yes, I did. Um, going to education, how is the state going to make sure that the students who are already slipping through the cracks are not going to continue? Yeah, it's a real concern and a, and a real issue. I, I, I uh, compliment the, the districts for doing creative things to, to connect their students. I compliment uh, Comcast and other providers for making free access to Internet access. It, it doesn't mean it, it actually got connected in homes, and that's a, 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 a challenge. Uh, I know Brandywine School District in particular, for example, uh, distributed uh, notebooks or, or um, laptops to help uh, with that, but without connectivity again. Uh, and so, and, and the other thing that I heard from teachers and students alike was just the engagement question, right? To get students to engage uh, as opposed not to engage when it's remote learning like that. Uh, we talked a little bit about that before. So yeah, it continues to be a challenge. I think it will continue to get better. I know the districts are conscious of it and obviously they have they also have legal obligations there which uh, that motivates them as well and us. Do we want to do that? So how are we doing? We have it looks like we're go with the uh, Dr. Walker. Great. So um, so as you can see here there's a myhealthycommunity.dhs.delaware.gov homepage that lands you once you click on a coronavirus tracker, you can start to see the same information on the dashboard that's displayed on the um, main homepage. But now, not only will you see the shading uh, that you can see on the right hand side of the screen with the rate of COVID cases per population, which again is a better marker than the number of cases because it's adjusted by the underlying number of people in that particular um, area. I think it, it displays where we may have areas of concern and you hover over them, you can see the number of positives per 10,000 people. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, we are worried about Sussex. Um, you can see the number of negatives as well. Uh, but as the, the question emerged, um, along with the number of cases, the age breakdown, here you can see the total cases by sex, female and male, um, and then you'll below that get to the total cases by race, ethnicity. So we've highlighted the number of unknown in the in the lower row, but you can also see the number of non-Hispanic blacks, non-Hispanic whites, Hispanic Latinos, other um, populations in the Asian Pacific Islander, along with the bar graph. And you'll see that although we still have a number of cases unknown, um, which we expect to drop because the public health um, order Dr. Rattay has required that physicians complete race ethnicity data, so it will improve over time. I think what's really important is, as the governor mentioned, you can see that 27% of our cases are white and 26% are black. About 23% of Delaware's population is black. So right now you don't see a, a huge difference in discrepancy in racial and ethnic uh, dis, dis, uh, disparity and difference between the underlying uh, uh, diversity in the population and the number of cases. But when you look at things more closely, like testing rates by race, we start to look at other factors, as you mentioned in your question. Um, and also you'll see that 14% are listed as Latino. You can also start to see a breakdown by um, the number of people in, in particular outcome areas. So you'll see here the total deaths by race and ethnicity broken down and you can see 62% um, of individuals who have died from COVID-19 are white. Did we lose you, Dr. Walker? You know, right now we have 7% about six people who are unknown. We're, we're trying to improve that information, uh, but I do want to make sure we highlight that. Hopefully I'm back, I can see everybody. Can you go back um, to and then I, Dr. Walker? Can you sure. go, can go back to that chart? We heard the very first part, the reference to the uh, the white uh, percentage, but uh, then you blacked out. Thank you. Um, so the total deaths by race, ethnicity are shown here. And again, it's the bar graph broken down by race, ethnicity categories. So we have the race uh, data for those who have died. About 62% of individuals who have died from COVID-19 are white. 
23% are Black and 4% are Hispanic Latino. Right now, we have about 7%, roughly six are unknown. Um, and sometimes that could be multiple uh, categories or um, not designated. We're constantly trying to make sure we improve this data, make more available. We anticipate adding more demographic data as we go. And as numbers become larger, we may have additional uh, dashboards and features available. So uh, please definitely go to this website. Um, feel free to let us know if there are certain things that you wanna know. Uh, as you can see here, we've also included uh, negative numbers so that people can uh, have access to this data. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. And one of the things to, to keep going back to, uh, and that with respect to the demographics, that is that overwhelmingly these are elderly uh, Delawareans, uh, sadly. Uh, there are grandmothers and grandfathers, and, uh, and they're folks that with, with underlying health conditions, which underscores again uh, the need for us to pr protect those populations, to be t talking to and supporting our elderly parents, uh, our neighbors, and the like. And one of the things that informs us as we look at uh, this spread in Sussex County, uh, knowing that the population there has a lot of retirees and a lot of elderly citizens. And I wanted to ask about the chicken processing plants. With the state starting testing this week, or working with the plants to do testing, how many have tested positive from those test results? So I don't have the exact number, uh, but it's very high. Is that something the state would make public? I don't think at this time we're able to do that, but at some point uh, we would like to do that. I guess what's the difference between having data about nursing homes and the number of cases and deaths. I think something people really want to know about, especially if you're working in these plants and live in these communities. So I think it's, it's twofold. One, it's small numbers at this point in terms of the number of, of cases that we've actually, a number of tests that we've actually done. And, uh, and it's a, the partnership that we've had with the, the plants in, in doing that. So we'll, we'll, we could sort that out as, as we go and, and do more testing. What we do know is that there were a testing, a lot more testing that was done by Christiana Care, again with a very high percentage of positive, uh, of positive cases. So if there was a large outbreak at one of the plants, the state would go public about it? Well, I think we are going public about the problem right now, talking about the issue that we have in this community uh, and, uh, and our efforts to, to address it. And there are certain governors that are, like in Iowa, for example, that are shutting down or urging plants to shut down due to concerns over continued outbreaks. Is that something that you would consider doing and, and what steps would have to happen? Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not aware of, uh, of plants that governors have shut down. I know plants have shut themselves down for various reasons. And it's certainly one of the options that, that we have if uh, we think it's the best thing for the safety of the workers and the population around the, around the plants. A uh, number of questions about Sussex County. Um, Mary Lou at WGMD says that she knows the focus on Sussex County is on the minority workers in the poultry plants to get them tested and educated on how to stay safe. Uh, but there are other work areas that are minority heavy, such as construction and landscaping companies. Are these types of businesses also getting the same type of scrutiny and attention as the poultry plants? So generally, we've, we've had some community uh, testing sites, uh, which were open to, to everyone in, in Sussex County, uh, and we expect to do more of that. Uh, we have uh, a list of, of those types of businesses that have workers uh, that uh, might be living in the same communities. And so, yes, we're, we're looking at uh, actions that we should take or should consider with respect to that workforce as well. Matt Biddle at the Delaware State News asks, why do you think Sussex has been hit disp disproportionately hard uh, with some of the recent statistics you're seeing? Well, it, it probably uh, kind of not my, in my area to, to speculate, but I, I've said at briefings that we had here uh, as long as several weeks ago when we first started to uh, pay attention to this and send uh, representatives of, of the Division of Public Health out to the plants after the first uh, positive case at the Milford plant uh, was identified. And you'll remember that the, the plant closed down 
uh, to go through and do a, a full cleaning and, and sanitation. And then when we had uh, a couple of days later another, another positive case in one of the other company's plants in Selbyville, that we knew we had the potential for significant spread, uh, knowing the communities in which a lot of these workers live are uh, very close together, uh, very dense uh, uh, popul uh, housing uh, in certain areas of, of the towns. And so we started reaching out to community organizations and to others to try to get the word out and address what we knew was gonna be a spread, uh, or we expected would be a spread in this community. And, uh, and we've seen that happen. Um, Matt Biddle again of the Delaware State News asks, what's the rationale behind not allowing more businesses such as furniture stores and barber shops to begin to open up by appointments only? Yeah, so um, barber, that's not kind of the area that I've spent a lot of atten uh, time on. The Secretary of State and his team at the Division of of public health have been uh, responding to companies and businesses and sectors that want to be exceptions uh, to our essential business shutdown. And so they have uh, kind of by application uh, approved uh, some, some businesses to, to move forward. Let me give you an example, in, particularly in, in the list that you gave, and that is, uh, say, realtors, and car dealers can do business by appointment only. Uh, you mentioned furniture st uh, stores. That's a business that theoretically could be doing uh, business by appointment only, and I know it was something that the Division of Small Business and the Department of State was thinking about. So that's kind of the way it will evolve. You know, let's, let's be clear about the situation, though. The guidance we have is the cases have to be, have to be declining consistently in Delaware before we start opening businesses sectors up. And that's what we're looking for. Now at the same time, we have this uh, spike in new cases in uh, Sussex County, which is gonna uh, m prevent that possibly from happening, or at least from getting to the starting line. And so we're gonna continue to look at uh, ways to, to do that, to uh, open businesses up as we, as we get healthier in the community, but we need to be healthy in the community first. DJ McEnany from WDEL asks, does the state plan to jump on Newcastle County's innovative partnership to study coronavirus spread statewide through wastewater analysis? So the first I, I know of the wastewater analysis piece is what I read in the paper. It wasn't anything done in conjunction uh, with our, our Division of Public Health. And uh, so I I'd, I'd that, defer that question. We're trying to find to uh, follow the, the science that, that public health officials are working on uh, today, uh, taking our lead from CDC and the White House uh, Task Force. And this is not uh, any science that, that I've heard of from my colleagues across the country, and that was the first I saw of it. Tom Lehman at WBOC asks, can you describe in detail the steps to get to phase one and then phase two? How many days will the state need to reopen once it gets the ball rolling on phase one? And will the clock go to phase one, restart with a single day that was higher the day before? Can you kind of go into some detail about that? Yeah, so I think we have this slide in the deck uh, that uh, goes through the various conditions that need to be present uh, on the ground uh, for economic uh, recovery. First of all, we're gonna, when possible, follow the guidance from CDC. We need to adapt some of those uh, measures and, and criteria to the Delaware situation. I talked a little bit about that in terms of consistent trend in declining cases, since our cases tend to spike up and down from day to day, uh, some kind of smoothing uh, measure that would, uh, maybe a percent of positive cases by day is what, what uh, statisticians have recommended. Uh, the next thing is that, uh, again, 14 days, you have to have those positive cases or some measure going down. The next slide, uh, and, and I mentioned this earlier on, uh, this, this has to be in place, uh, the ability to hire and train several hundred t contact tracers, and more importantly, or certainly as importantly, the ability to have the testing capacity to test enough people statewide 
uh, in, in and in you know areas of, of concern, so that you can deploy uh, this cadre of public health workers to make the contacts uh, with uh, folks that the positive people have come in contact with and who might be sick and positive as well. Uh, we also need to, again, have the reliable source of, of tests, uh, the next. And also that, and this is something they talked about, uh, working with various sectors to figure out how businesses can open uh, to follow uh, more rigid uh, social distancing uh, requirements and guidelines. And we'll be working uh, with each uh, sector on that. It also might mean opening in certain sectors with uh, the requirement that people wear masks, both the employees and folks that are uh, going to that uh, particular business. And, and we're, as I said, working out on these details. I think that's it in that stack. So that, that answers that question. So declining trends in number of cases or percentage of positives, the ability to test and do contact tracing on the ground, the ability to protect uh, frontline uh, healthcare workers and first responders, and hospital capacity in place uh, should we need to address a surge. The next question is from the Delaware Public Media, uh, perhaps best for Dr. Walker. Um, in light of the new racial and ethnic ethnicity-based data that we're seeing, uh, is there any intent to discuss going down maybe even lower below zip code level to census level block data? Dr. Walker, did you hear the question? Yes, thank you. Um, so what we what we really appreciate about the My Healthy Community um, webpage is that it is um, it overlays not only geography but also makes sure that we're putting some filters in to make sure that um, we're not reporting data that allows people to be easily identified and thereby releasing um, you know individual level um, information that that really would allow someone to be identified from these maps. So. The challenge with census tract is that as you get smaller and smaller by neighborhood or block, it's very easy to figure out who that one person is based on their age and gender and, and where they're living. So this um, this tool will allow us to report that information by census tract once we have enough cases and numbers easily identified. And usually that means by census tract you may have you know 10 or more people um, so that you can't identify them but we have those filters in place to both provide information in a transparent way but also to ensure we're protecting individual privacy and um, so continue to check back on the website again as unfortunately as numbers grow it will be easier to report that information at lower and lower um, levels thank you dr walker thanks dr walker the next question is from uh, Joseph DiStefano at the Philadelphia Inquirer. He asks, uh, says, according to FEMA data, Delaware has received far more PPE, N95 ventilators, and other coronavirus equipment given its population than next door neighbor Pennsylvania. Um, the question is, is there any reason Delaware has been more successful in getting requests filled from FEMA? And uh, does anybody deserve credit for bringing more federal aid to Delaware? I give credit to A.J. Shaw, I think. <laughs> Um, so I haven't looked at the specifics next to us, next to Pennsylvania. Um, I will tell you, we worked with our federal partners very closely uh, and provided uh, burn rates for what we think we would use for about a 14 day period and then request that as needed. So uh, without looking at the data, I, I would be unable to say why we might keep you getting more than them. But, uh, you know, I, I think everybody in the region works together. We have calls with, um, you know, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, DC, and West Virginia uh, several times a week with our, our FEMA regional administrator and talk about a number of these issues. So uh, I don't think anybody gets credit more than the other. We're all in this together, just like we are in the state. The final question for today comes from Susan Canfora at Coastal Point Newspaper. She says, is there any direction from the governor's office for beach businesses wondering whether or not to order souvenirs, supplies, and even start interviewing employees for summer help? Some really aren't sure what to do. Any kind of forecasting on if businesses will reopen at the beach, Governor? Yeah, that's a, a really tough question and, and one that I've gotten on our uh, uh, the conference calls that we have with the state's mayors and the conference calls that we had this week uh, on the uh, Restaurant Association, since many of those are there, 
I'm just going to ask if we could put up on the screen again uh, the 14-day slide uh, just to give some folks a certain idea. So, again, as I said, what, what, are the con what do the conditions have to be in order to start reopening uh, beaches, for instance? And there's a specific reference in uh, the White House guidelines, the CD guidelines, with respect to beaches, with respect to uh, bars, uh, and with respect to other uh, businesses. But first of all, you have to have declining uh, cases. We're probably going to define that by percent of positive cases, so moving uh, downward, fewer day by day, uh, for a 14-day period. And uh, those, all those other conditions that I mentioned in place, a contact tracing uh, ability and core of, of public uh, health uh, employees, a testing regime and capacity to do uh, double the amount of testing that, that we're doing now, the ability to, to provide protection uh, for our healthcare workers and first responders with PPE, and a comfort level with respect to hospital ca capacity, and, and in particular, critical care and ICU capacity, which is something that we look at and are concerned about. So if you, if you have those all ready to go in 14 days, then you can move to phase one. Uh, and I'm sorry, if you have the declining cases 14 days, you can move to phase one. If you have all those other things in line, you, you have, need another 14 days of declining cases to start to really uh, start opening things up, uh, which includes beaches. So if you do the math together, that's 28 days. If, you, if, you, if we were to start tomorrow, which we're not ready to start tomorrow, uh, that would put you at the end of May. Uh, and so we're at least uh, weeks, a couple weeks or more uh, at, in front of the starting line, add 28 days to that, and that gives you an idea of when we might be thinking about uh, opening beaches, to be specific to the question. And I think that was the last one. Uh, one of the harder ones of the afternoon and one of the more difficult ones as we uh, move forward in the next uh, next month. And as I said uh, at a press conference earlier earlier in the week, the decisions that we have to make today uh, to address the situation in Sussex County and the decisions that we have to make over the next month as to when and how to open our uh, reopen our economy in a phased, gradual, safe, and sound way are going to be the most difficult decisions that we've had to make uh, during this, uh, this pandemic. And uh, we need to do it uh, with your help. Uh, we need to do it with your understanding. Uh, we need to do it with your cooperation uh, because we're not going to get to the starting line for the countdown until we have a declining number of cases. And right now, we have an increasing number of cases by day, uh, although the today's number doesn't show that. We'll see that probably tomorrow. Uh, and we have uh, an outbreak that we need to get uh, control of to make sure that it doesn't spread uh, anymore. And uh, we are all hands on deck uh, addressing that issue. So again, I want to remind everybody uh, to stay at home to practice basic hygiene, wash your hands, cough into your sleeve, talk to your neighbors, protect your, uh, your grandmothers and grandfathers, your moms and dads who are senior citizens, and together we'll be able to save lives. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend.